Welcome to this week's Dividend Cafe podcast, and for a few of you, the video. This is David Bonson. I am the Chief Investment Officer and Managing Partner at the Bonson Group, recording from the home study here in uh, my house in Newport Beach, and I think it's going to end up being one of our longer Dividend Cafe recordings this week. Um, it, one of the reasons is I'm committed to try to cover all the topics this week that I cover in the written Dividend Cafe, which uh, the written one is definitely the longest that we've ever done. Um, I'm recording the middle of the market day on Friday, and as I'm recording, uh, the market had been up 1,000 points on the week uh, Monday through Wednesday and is down 1,000 points on the week Thursday and Friday. I don't know where it'll end up for the week, but we're actually flat on the week now, even being down 1,000 points in the last uh, couple of days. So... Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about what the market's done in the last two days or four days or what it's going to do in the next two days or four days. I have a lot of other topics I want to cover this week, but that that issue does sort of tee up um, what I think is the most important thing I'm going to say this week and what I let off in, my, in the written DividendCafe.com with. And it's, 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 I allude to this sort of tension that I feel week by week. Um, in the writing of Divin Cafe, and and I don't expect it, people to fully understand it, but it, the struggle is real, and 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 I want to unpack it a little for you. I very much believe that um, the Divin Cafe is at least intended to be worthwhile for for our clients, and and to a lesser degree for for readers who are non clients. Um, there is a, a high degree of conviction. And, and I hope uh, at least some of the time value that can come out of that material. The perspective is ours. The perspective is not um, shallow in the level of work and research and contemplation that has gone into forming it. And so I hope that there is a combination of both um, long-term wisdom and short-term um, execution that is worthwhile in the way Dividend Cafe is articulated week by week. And yet I am constantly uh, reminding myself, and this is where that sort of tension comes from, and, and even gets to things like me talking about the market was up this week or down this week or whatever, that I have never seen um, a client's financial goals undermined by something that was addressed in in Divin Cafe weekly market commentary, like the we thought the Fed might do this and they did that instead, and it and it changed our whole uh, financial apparatus. I've never seen a view on a sector that then four months later we might have a different sector, and either now or four months later or what have you, that viewpoint um, resulted in either the achievement of a goal or the undermining of a goal. Uh, and so is it, is that to say that the things we write about are not important if I'm suggesting that they don't make and break financial goals? It's not so simple. What, what I'm getting at is that somewhere between 97 and 99.9% of the time, in all of my years investing client capital, I have seen um, basically one large major category that has a lot of subdivisions within it uh, represent the um, either success or failure of a financial goal. And that is uh, investor behavior. And, and, and out of that, what I mean is the propensity for an investor to feed off of um, the, their own human nature. That, that in a period of uh, accumulation, the temptation to accelerate one's own accumulation of capital with over-concentration, with um, excessive leverage, with what we call too-good-to-be-truism, you know, can't miss things that they have to swing uh, for, that, that, those types of things which are, are never going to go away. And we've seen them so many times I can't even count. Um, they, they destroy financial goals. And on the flip side of that, which is far, far more appropriate in the context we're in now with the, with the severe market distress that people saw in the month of March and, and the really quite serious uncertainty that exists in the uh, both American and global economy right now, 
I believe that the fear side of human emotion uh, can give way to a panic and then out of that panic behavior um, that, that can decimate one's chances of financial success and the goals that they may have. And, and I believe that if there was only one thing I could ever really, really instill into the clients whom I serve, it would be the necessity of, of behavior, uh, avoiding big mistakes and staying faithful to behavioral wisdom that will allow for their financial goals to be achieved uh, to accumulate capital without um, intervening mistakes and in their spending phase of life to whether it's for kids, college, grandkids, college, quote unquote, retirement, and more and more hate that word. But my point being the spending phase, a withdrawal of capital phase that, that everyone will have to one degree or another in their lives um, to allow that to take place safely and uh, robustly without, without uh, intervening mistakes. And so to the extent that I'm not sure that Dividend Cafe in what it covers week by week is necessarily getting to the heart of what really will either make or break a financial goal, I wonder sometimes if the um, uh, amount of attention that is put into it is, is proportionate to the value people are getting out of it. But I do believe that the material being covered is important. I want more informed clients. I want uh, clients to take an interest in monetary theory or economic theory. And, and don't worry, we're going to have some of that here in just a moment. But I don't want those things to ever be portrayed as we look to sort of analyze the ad hoc realities of the health pandemic right now, or what we believe the Fed might be doing a couple quarters out, or the state of the American energy sector, or uh, all of these types of things. I, I want it to be valuable, but I don't want it to be presented as anything other than what it is, which is information that develops a knowledge base that uh, then is uh, incumbent upon us to apply with wisdom and, and to do so in a manner that will facilitate client goals. And what the clients have to do then is, is avoid the mistakes and demonstrate the behavior that will help that whole plan and process play out successfully. So that's what we do. And, and I hope that this setup for you just gives you a little glimpse into my thinking as to what I view the, the value of Dividend Cafe to be and what I view the value to not be. And, and with that said, let me jump into a lot of the topics that are kind of you know present right now. That I don't. I think when you look at a, uh, a stock market rally in April, it was the biggest month in the market since January of 1987, 33 years. So the S and P was up uh, over 12 percent. The Dow was up over 11 percent. It was a, a very good month for the dividend growers and and the areas of the market that we really believe in. A lot of the financials and energy companies had a big rebound kind of odd just because the lockdowns aren't even done yet and and we're by no means even through the worst of how bad the economic damage is going to get let alone been able to start to measure the economic recovery um no matter who you're talking to the economic recovery is coming third quarter or fourth quarter or first quarter next year it's not coming now and and yet the markets um ha had begun to kind of rebound off of those march you know panics and uh, yet the volatility still remains very high. The VIX is still, you know, well into the 30s, uh, perhaps going to get back into the 40s. And like I said earlier, at least as of the time I'm recording right now, the market had gone up a thousand this week and has now gone down a thousand. So volatility remains consistent. So what in the world could explain why equities have done so well in the, in the last week, week until the last couple of days, the last month? Uh, uh, and, and why they may very well do better than a lot of people have expected throughout this, this pandemic period and economic uh, uncertainty. Uh, that Tina trade, there is no other, no other alternative, excuse me, is incredibly important right now uh, because of the Fed and, and because of a zero interest rate policy uh, it, before we had zero interest rates, which we've had for a whopping, you know, uh, what, uh, six weeks now, six or seven weeks. Before that, the 10-year was at 
In every bear market we've had that I studied, going back 10 bear markets, the competitive interest rate starting the bear market was 4%, 7%, 5.5%. So people had the ability to say, we're in a bear market, we're in a recession, we're in bad times. I would like to go make 50 grand a year on every million dollars of investable capital I have while I wait this out. Right now, they can't make $6,000 a year on a million dollars of capital with a 10-year treasury bond. I mean, think about what I just said. Million dollars of capital, and your interest rate will pay you about $6,000 of federally taxable money a year, okay? Now, to the extent that uh, one understands how risk assets work and are measured up against a risk-free alternative, you can probably then do a little bit of guesswork to say that even if you consider large cap U.S. stocks to not be the safest thing in the world, next to European stocks, next to Japanese stocks, next to Chinese stocks, next to commodities, next to a whole lot of other things that might exist on planet Earth, um, or other coupon paying instruments. You say, okay, well, treasury bonds are real low, but what if I go into these other types of either high yield bonds or what have you, that either in safety, there is a virtually 0% uh, income and return, and in risk, there is a relative better uh, risk environment for U.S. stocks, particularly large cap, than the rest of the world. Uh, does that mean that U.S. large cap stocks don't have risk? No. Does that mean that there are not plenty of people that would rather make 0% in cash than take on the volatility of the U.S. stock market? Plenty of people would. But it explains the, the relative framework that we're talking about that makes a lot of past events somewhat obsolete because the compelling case for Tina, there is no alternative, um, and the relative value of equities compared to the other past likely replacements in volatile periods, cash and, and treasuries, it, it, it's very different. And I think that helps explain a lot of why I expect um, the investing world to maintain some appetite for U.S. stocks, even as we have to sort through inevitable realities of bear markets and recessions. Um, th then you get to that point, though, where you also beg the question a little bit about the recession. How long will it go? How deep will it go? When will we come out? And how will we come out? And, I, and no one knows the answer to any of those things. But here's what we do know the answer to. Historically, the market has uh, led the exit of a recession by six months. And this is a very important fact that I read about earlier in the week I want to remind you of. That has nothing to do with when we know we're out of the recession. That's when we have the information with the gift of hindsight to look back and say, hey, look, the market went up on this date and we were out of the recession on this date and there's six months in between. But we generally don't know we're out of a recession until even three or four months or longer than we were, which means sometimes there can be in real time 10 months or longer between the time that stocks have begun going up and the time that one knows they are out of a recession. You follow what I'm saying? So I think to appreciate the reality of equities as discounting mechanisms and forward-looking vehicles and the historical reality um, that that stocks lead uh, recession out of recessions much more than the GDP growth itself does is very important. But then now we have this whole conversation around earnings, which are, are very opaque and very uh, questionable because of coronavirus, because of the, the economy being shut down and when exactly earnings growth will be able to reestablish a footing. And yet I also have to remind uh, myself, and not to mention others, that the vast majority of stock price movement coming out of a recession initially is not that the earnings acceleration itself has taken place. That comes later. It's initially um, an expansion of the multiple, the price-earnings ratio, the valuation, 
elevates first in anticipation of better times. And then, of course, the better times themselves come and manifest themselves in the form of better earnings growth. And so it kind of undermines the possibility of waiting for it or timing it. It just simply doesn't work. And, and it also provides a lot of explanation to why sometimes things may seem to be going better than you think they ought to be. None of which is to argue against the reality of a choppy market, of a range-bound market, or even a potential reversal in markets. Uh, the health pandemic is real, and there's a, some charts at Dividend Cafe to kind of illustrate where things stand. But um, as far as the improvement in case growth, in our capacity for daily testing, in a decline of daily uh, mortalities, and also where I think is probably the most important element from a, well, certainly quality of life and human life standpoint, but also the economic measurement of risk is um, hospitalizations and our kind of uh, capacity to, to treat things. That was really the heart of the matter in March when so many believed that we were going to overwhelm the American health system. And the fact that the uh, hot areas, so to speak, you know, New York has still had 33% of, of coronavirus cases in the country and 36% of mortalities, and yet they've had a 75 to 80% decline in hospitalizations. And so we're just in a, a significantly different outlook in the present tense and future tense around the health pandemic, and that's a very uh, encouraging thing right now. But is the data necessarily as optimistic as we wanted it to be at this point? I still feel like there's a little bit of we're, we're there, but we're not quite there yet. Like the case growth has declined, but as far as then getting it to a plateau and then, and then really getting, you know, all the way down to the zero range or experiencing some of what they were able to see in South Korea, Taiwan, what have you, we, we haven't quite got there. We have work to, to do. It's, it's largely in specific areas. It's not a, a 50 state issue right now. And that's a good thing, but there's more work to be done, and, I, and we'll see if, in fact, that case growth really drops next week the way a lot anticipate it will. But my point being that the worst uh, risk of the health pandemic has largely been priced away, and most of the risk right now and uncertainty is not in how bad coronavirus gets, but in how long and how bad the economic damage from the shutdown gets. And we just can't begin to answer that question until the shutdown ends. And so hopefully measured, safe, and yet, um, you know, earnest efforts to reopen the American economy will begin very soon. Out of the reopening of the American economy, I'm spending a lot of time thinking about what are the areas that are opportunistic, what areas we want to be focused on. And I do believe structured credit, as I've talked about. Um, I don't want to get into the granularity of what all this means, but the securitization of cash flows around residential mortgages, commercial mortgages uh, that created a kind of asset class of bonds that we call structured credit remains very dislocated. Uh, there are structures in place that remain um, with very, very low historical, if any, default rate whatsoever. And, and yet uh, have seen their spreads widen um, and, and still hopefully represent the opportunity for investors that they've historically represented with spreads this wide. So there are some charts and uh, kind of elaborations at Dividend Cafe around the commercial mortgage market, um, the, the concept of a credit risk transfer in residential mortgage-backed securities, whereby Fannie and Freddie in 2013 and 14 began um, selling off part of their book so these were conforming loans that were underwritten to Fannie Freddie standards, but then were transferred off into the private sector. So they now have a lot of the Fannie Freddie components and they kept a tiny bit of skin in the game, yet they don't have the full faith and, and underwriting of the United States government behind them. And so that credit risk has been transferred in the private sector and that has allowed for a really big disconnect in these pools of residential mortgages from those that still maintain what we call agency uh, Fannie Freddie bonds. In, in a lot of these uh, sectors, the dislocations, the spread widenings, I think are out of proportion with the risk and, and have created 
an asymmetrical opportunity for reward. Read about that at Dividend Cafe, and of course, we're going to continue talking about it. Interestingly enough, as we've had just a couple weeks of cartoonishly odd headlines in the oil sector, the midstream energy space has just got done having its best month of all time. Now, it, uh, it, its drawdown was so severe from peak to trough prior to April, but even basically five weeks in a row at roughly a 7 to 8% weekly gain, um, you know, it's still uh, not recovered, obviously, everything it was down, but really significant gains in the energy space, and I think a greater understanding of what names are very likely to persist. Uh, you saw some dividend maintenance and even dividend growth in some of the high-quality names in energy midstream this week, and uh, what the, how those names' business model, um, storing excess oil and gas and transporting um, natural gas, which is in high demand, uh, and and uh, crude oil, which obviously has had its demand right now evaporate, but um, we we face a future that requires oil and gas to be produced in our country more and more. And even as that overall production is right now facing severe headwinds, the midstream sector and its um, business model had not only had a great month of April, we we like where it's headed in the names we're in. Uh, 30 out of the last 90 years, the S&P 500 had negative earnings. It, it uh, made less money than the year before. And yet in those 30 years, 77% of them were up years in the market. This is not to say that as earnings have completely, you know, cratered around the economic shutdown, that we expect stocks are going to be up on the year necessarily. It is just to say that if stocks are up in a period of earnings deceleration, that is um, almost 80% of the time the case. It is not the exception. It would be the rule, more or less. The 23% would be the exception to the rule. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Most of them are, by the way, connected to the point I made before of stock price recovery um, predating the GDP recovery. But uh, I think it's important for us to keep that historical perspective. I put a chart of that at Dividend Cafe, uh, as well as a chart of the infamous weeks in March, the amount of selling pressure that existed in just bond funds alone to be able to visualize over $100 billion of forced bond redemptions from the mutual fund world in just a matter of about 10 days is surreal. And uh, uh, that illustration indicating why exactly that liquidity pinch uh, was so severe. Um, there is a long period, uh, a, long, a long portion, not too long. I don't want to give the impression it's some boring thing, but uh, uh, I tried to really do as good a job as I could unpacking <clears throat> the monetary theory and, and I think the broader economic theory behind um, why we believe the efforts of the Fed right now are deflationary, not inflationary, and why the overall debt cycle we're in is deflationary and not inflationary. And how the velocity of money works. So the concept of money turning over in a society when there's greater demand for money um, and greater demand for transactions. So that essentially... If one ever wants to stimulate economic activity or for some reason want to stimulate inflation, it would come from the greater production of goods and services, which then triggers velocity of money, which when combined with a big increase in the money supply, we know from Fisher's money, the Fisher's money theory, that creates inflation. That's the price theory of money. However, what you have to understand is that the decline in demand for money comes from uh, a weakness in production goods and services in the economy that then feeds on itself. Uh, to the extent there's more organic production of goods and services that are met with customer demand, you get that uh, animal spirits. It, it is not Keynesian. It is far more supply side. And yet you feed on yourself. And, and, and to the degree that at that point money supply was accelerating, you would end up because of higher velocity with inflation. What I am suggesting to you is that those that are worried about inflation right now are not wrong to be worried about something. They're just worrying about the wrong thing. The deflationary pressures that compress 
demand and compress um, productivity from the economy is the far bigger issue long term. So if you've heard all this and this stuff sounds like something you're interested in getting into a little more, please read Dividend Cafe. The stimulus that is passed, I'm not counting the monetary stimulus and the Fed. The fiscal efforts so far alone amount to over 20% of GDP as we project them out uh, with the leverage put on and, and the kind of whole package. Uh, phase four is very likely coming as well. And this has all been done, as you know, in less than two months. Uh, there's a chart at DividendCafe.com contrasting the level of stimulus as a percentage of GDP that we did in past slowdowns and the amount of time that stimulus played out. And so one can see why the magnitude and the speed of the stimulus is categorically different than anything we've ever seen, for good or for bad. But my point being, it certainly isn't for nothing. It, it is to be um, understood as a what rather gigantic economic occurrence and, and therefore impacts the way we view the potential um, uh, ways that the economy will play out in the months ahead. The Fed this week um, reinforced their kind of support for certain markets. There was no real earth-shattering news. The Bank of Japan went a little more accommodating than people were expecting. The European Central Bank, I guess, went a little less accommodating whenever $750 billion U.S. dollars is less accommodating. But, um, you know, the Fed certainly reiterated they're going to continue bond buying as much as they feel they need to support financial stabilization, and they're going to keep the interest rate at zero as long as the eyes can see. Uh, I did even revisit our kind of politics and money section, sort of proposing a little contrarian theory out there that um, although I believe it's becoming less likely that uh, Joe Biden is going to select Elizabeth Warren as his running mate to be VP. I'm not totally sure that that's exactly the great uh, thing a lot of markets might want, expect it to be, a lot of investors might, to the extent people would view Elizabeth Warren as, as potentially a liability for markets. Her not being named VP means she's still out there for a regulatory role, a treasury secretary role, a cabinet role, so I'm kind of throwing my own little twist on the idea that um, th there is that political you know, nuance to be thinking about. But overall, I stand by my theory that markets are not thinking about the presidential election right now much at all. It, it, just like most citizens probably aren't. It's so far away, so much still can happen. Okay, well, I'm coming up on the 30-minute mark that I told myself I was going to stick to. So I'm going to go ahead and end the podcast here. I appreciate you bearing with me. We did cover a lot of ground. There are really so many charts and elaborations of things at uh, DividendCafe.com. I'd love for you to check that out. Um, and to the extent, I don't think I've said this through the whole coronavirus period, but if you would like to share this podcast or video with others, if you would like to rate us on iTunes or Stitcher, whatever your player is, uh, write a review, um, any of those kinds of things, we certainly appreciate it. It really helps uh, the way that those things are measured and scaled. So please um, do so if you are so inclined. And beyond that, reach out to anyone at the Bonson Group anytime, anything we can do to help you, we're here to do. Have a wonderful weekend, and please be well, be safe, and be free. Thank you for listening to The Dividend Cafe. <music>